Beloved, our text for meditation this morning is the gospel lesson that we just shared together in John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May his love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. On this, the second Sunday of Epiphany, we still consider what's inside. And what I enjoy most about today's text is how closely connected our limited mindset is to the approach of Scripture today. Many of us would be skeptical to talk about the reality of miracles. We would think that that's a little bit too much, a little too radical to think that God would show up in our lives in a miraculous way and do something supernatural that goes beyond anything logical. It just doesn't make sense if I can't explain it, if I can't contain it, or if it's not defined by science. So I really would rather leave that miraculous stuff alone, and we try to do away with that and get uncomfortable when we talk about it, because miracles clearly couldn't happen in today's context. That's the heart of today's text. And dear friends, I submit to you that this thought is not just for laity, not just for parishioners, not just for people sitting in the pews. I submit to you that there are many a pastor who carry the same mindset. The countless sermons I have heard based on this text to do anything but talk about how uncomfortable it is to have a miracle from God. We want to talk about what the mother of Jesus said to them at the wedding of Cana. There's a reason I said the mother of Jesus, but we'll get to that in the text. We talk about the place called Cana. This is interesting stuff. We want to talk about that. We talk about the fact that Jesus is at a wedding, and so weddings have got to be important because within the first couple of verses, wedding is mentioned several times. All of this to escape talking about the tension of a miracle taking place. I submit to you, that even in the advancements that we have in this, the 21st century, our mindset and our thinking is a first century culture. You are no different than anybody in the text. We are no different than anybody in the text. So this morning, I invite us to sit in that very tension. The fact that we serve a God who exists outside of our limited worldview or scientific explanation. His abilities exceed any human sinful explanation of what we could ever fathom. And so let's sit in that tension that that's the God we serve. I submit to you verses 9 through 10 of our text. Chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. When the master of the feast tasted the water now wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine, but you have kept the good until now. The first century was just as amazed at Jesus as we are today. I submit to you this morning that when Jesus shows up to your party of life, Expect a miracle. Expect God to do some supernatural things when you invite him to the party of your life. The bridegroom was so amazed that the, the master, the host of the party, he calls the bridegroom over and tells him how to throw a party. He says, you don't even know how to be hospitable. This isn't what happens. You serve the good stuff first. Can I just make this plain? I think the kid... And then after they drunk, then you pull out the cheap stuff because they don't really care at that point. You don't know how to party. Who, who saves the good stuff to last? Because we don't know how Jesus interacts. And so I started with the end of the text so that we would have an understanding to remind us that God cannot be rationalized. He is outside of our limits. So now let's take a look at what happens. In verses 1 through 2, 
we are provided some very basic details about the setting. And, and, and we can follow along, be it in scripture or, or in your bulletin. On the third day, there was a wedding at Canaan in Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. We are given the when, the who, the why, but we're also giving something else specific. We are told on the third day. John is very, very interesting in his writing because he's challenging us to do something that I invite us to do regularly. Make sure you're reading your word. Because on the third day, you would have to ask what happened on the... And now the third day, right? And so John is setting us up to make sure that we are paying attention to scripture, that we are reading the word of God, that we are engrossed in this journey with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he does this to set up the chronologically ordered miracle of Jesus. He mentions this because watch what happens in John chapter 1, verse 50. In John chapter 1, verse 50. Just in case you're too cold, we put it on the screen. Ready? Jesus answered him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. <laughs> and on the third day, guess what happens? Greater things than these. And so he wants to make sure you are following along. And so now you have the third day and we are about to experience greater things. So let's talk about who's at this experience. The central participants are given to us in the miracle. Notice something. This is in verses one and two. We are told who's there. The mother of... Notice something. John never mentions her by name. The mother of Jesus. She was there. Then it goes on to say, Jesus and his disciples. We don't get a name of the disciples. Jesus and his boys are invited to. What wedding you've been invited to that don't have save the date? So and so would like to formally invite you to the. We ain't even told who's getting married. Why? Because Jesus is the central theme of the text. Nothing else matters in your life or at your party as long as Jesus is there. We don't need to worry about who else is there as long as Jesus is the central character of your text and of your story. So whatever it is we are doing in life, when Jesus is the focus, guess what? Greater things will happen. Miraculous things will happen as long as we are focused on Jesus. And so why are they gathered? They are gathered at a wedding. The wedding is mentioned in two sentences because marriage was and is and will always be important. But not for the reasons you and I might be thinking. Ephesians chapter 5. In Ephesians chapter 5, I want to take you to verse 32. Now, from a pastoral point of view, Ephesians chapter 5 is a very interesting text, especially when I'm working with couples and getting married. Because number one, the first thing that happens is in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence to Christ. But here is where I lose couples all the time, and, and, and we'll get to verse 32. It says, wives, submit to your husband and it falls silent. <laughs> Makeup starts to run, she scoots away, he fades back. Do we really have to use the word submit? But then it says, husbands, love your wives as Christ. Hmm. Why is wedding important? Now we can go to Ephesians chapter 5, verse 32, right? This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to. And so he's giving us a picture of what happens in the church. 
And, and so it has absolutely nothing to do with you submitting to him. And I submit to you that if he is a man of God, there would be no issue because he would be acting like Christ treats his bride, the church. And so wedding is mentioned to remind us what God is setting us up for. How are we behaving as the bride? Do we expect the bridegroom to treat us well? Do we expect the bridegroom to lay down his life for us, to carry us over the threshold, to constantly give us gifts? And so the wedding is mentioned not because it matters who's throwing this week-long party, but so that you are reminded of what our relationship with God should be like. And so now we find ourselves in verses 3 through 5. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, for the past couple of weeks, I have been trying to stress to us the importance of obedience to God's word. But that's not the focus of today's text. But there is obedience to God's word. When we have obedience to God's word, miraculous things happen. We cannot expect God to hook us up and we are walking in disobedience to his word. Don't expect the hookup if you're not willing to follow directions. And that becomes stressful for us because we always want to gimme, gimme, gimme when it comes to God. And the question becomes, what is our response to God's word. His mother said, do whatever he tells you. And that's uncomfortable for us. We don't take direction well. We, we, we know how to do things ourselves. And then it says, they ran out of wine. Let me take you to Isaiah 25, verse 6. Isaiah 25, verse 6. And you can follow along. On this mountain... The Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, rich, full of marrow, and aged wine well-refined. Dear friends, biblically, wine represents joy. Wine represents hope. Wine represents life. Can I ask you a question this morning? Just, Just talk to me, warm me up just a little bit. Hands are a little cold, need some heat. Do you ever run out of wine? Do you ever run out of joy? I mean, in the midst of the party and you still ain't got no wine, glass full as the day is long. But I have no wine. I have no hope. I have no life. Dry. And Jesus is being entrusted by his mother to do something about them not having any joy. My question to you is, what do you do when you're thirsty? Where do you run when you are out of wine? Oh, don't tell me about the local liquor store. Where do you run when you are out of joy? What do you seek satisfaction from? We've been to enough parties, but yet we're still dry. We're still out of wine. Where do you run to fill your thirst? Mary already gave a clue. She said, do whatever he tells you to do. John opened by saying this was the word made flesh. Do you run to the word to have your joy restored? Or are we going to continue to try to do this thing on our own? Allow me to take you to John chapter 4, verses 13 through 15. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. 
Dear friends, I, I, I submit it to you already that the miracles of God defy logic. It defies reasoning. It makes no sense. But your rational self, my rational self, is already broken, busted, and dry and out of wine. We keep running to the same old stuff and not getting any satisfaction. And the question becomes, are we doing whatever he tells us to do? Let me take you just a little deeper. Verses 6 through 7. And you can get excited because we did the last verses first, so we're almost finished. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. J just let me humor us one more time. Now, there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up with water. What's amazing to me, and why I read that for you again, is we are given more detail about these six jars than we are about anything else in the story. Jesus' mama don't even get a name. We don't even know who's hosting the wedding, but we are told that there are six jars for the Jewish rite of purification that hold 30 gallons of water. Now listen, I'm not too much on math. So I looked it up. One gallon of water is eight pounds. One vessel holds 30 gallons of water. Mathematically speaking, that's 240 pounds of water. There are six of them. I want to make sure I got my math right. I'm not, I, I, I wrote down some notes for you. That's 1,440 pounds of water. Jesus said, fill them up. It's interesting to me because this capacity is enormous. And I, and I was wrestling with why we got so much detail about six vessels of water. Because this text continues to blow my mind. I, I, I've been reading my scripture for a number of years, and I tell you this is why you should read. But as I was preparing this, I saw some stuff in verse 12 that I had never seen in a couple decades. But six, we serve a God who is extravagant. We serve a God who is overflowing. We serve a God who is abundant. You, you quote it all the time, John 10.10. 10. I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Can we be personal for just a moment? Just a moment. Just give me a few moments. Because as we're wrestling with this, the other thing I had to rest with, wrestle with is it says the Jewish purification. The Jewish tradition. The religious things... We're empty. We're dry. Can you talk to me for just a moment? Has your church experience ever been dry? Has it ever been empty? And so the question becomes again, how do you fill it up? You can do a whole lot of religious stuff and he'll still have a dry experience. But unless you invite Jesus to your church, to your religious experience, it will continue to be dry. And he says, fill them up. In other words, there's going to take a process or it's going to be a whole lot of servants to go somewhere and fill up 
240 pounds of water, you try carrying it. I ain't going to do it. Which means you got to go get a little bit of bucket and keep walking back and forth to fill up 240 pounds worth of water. Because you didn't get to that place of dryness overnight. Imagine the number of parties you went to trying to find satisfaction. But we won't spend five minutes in the process of God's word, but we want a miracle. Imagine the number of relationships that you have destroyed trying to find satisfaction, but we won't spend five minutes developing our relationship with God. It takes a process. He's undoing some stuff. But we want it instantaneously. God, give it to me right now or I'm done with this. And God, since you didn't hook me up yesterday, that church stuff, that miracle stuff is not what I really want. We don't want to participate in the process. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, as we're wrestling with these six vessels. Now to him who is able to do far more than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Beloved, in the book of Exodus, we are introduced to another name of God. That name is El Shaddai which means that we serve a God who is more than enough. Why did the children of God just settle at enough? Settle at mediocrity. There, there is a running joke, there was a running joke, in my house as my kids were growing up and we were trying to teach them the importance of keeping house. I would tell them both, when y'all move out and you invite me over, I'm bringing my own chair, my own silverware, and my own food. Because what I'm watching here is not a reflection of how you were raised. And so when we operate with the children of God and we settle for mediocrity, we settle for less than or just enough, it's not a reflection of God because our God is more than enough. Our God is abundant. He's asking us to do even more than enough, even when it's challenging. You do just enough on the job. You do just enough in the marriage. You do just enough at church, just enough with your friends. When do you invest in the relationship and do more than enough? Again, I share with you that we serve a God who is enough and that who is more than enough. And so that as his children, we should always want to do more than enough. Matthew chapter five, verses 39 through 41. He challenges us even when things are difficult to do more than enough. But I say to you, don't resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, do more than enough. <laughs> Turn the other cheek. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, do more than enough. Let them have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, get in shape and do more than enough. And go with him two miles. And so we have these six vessels for Jewish purification because he is going to do more than enough. He already told you in your favorite Bible verse, right? You don't even have to be religious. That your cup. Because <laughs> it's more than enough. If we engage in the process, he's sharing with us that some miraculous things are going to happen. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. In Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17. It says, in order to experience this process, it says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently, find me. Are you actively engaged in the process? Are we actively engaged in the process? Are your vessels dry and ready to be filled with Jesus' joy? Are we ready for something different to happen? Yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. Yes, it's going to cause us to get out of our comfort zones. 
But what we've been doing ain't working. And it's leaving us empty. And he's simply inviting us to obey him. So why, why? And, and, and then we're done. We just got to cover Matthew 9, 17. What struck me is that he did not tell them to fill up the pitchers of wine that they already used. Jesus is not going to put his stuff in our messed up stuff. Neither is new wine put into old wine skins. If it is, the skins burst and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. He wants to leave no doubt that he is doing something new in us. There will be no confusion that he used some syrup and some water and some Kool-Aid mix and stuff. Mm-mm, mm-mm. No, you're not even going to try to touch this. This is Jesus all day long. And the problem with many of us is we want to settle in what we've been doing. So... We want to say we run in the vacuum, but we have swept everything under the rug and that big old mountain is just around there because we got to do something different. And he's saying, I have new wine for you and let's be about that business. And so, dear friends, as uncomfortable as it is, our invitation today is allow Jesus to fill us to the brim with his love and his joy as we respond to his word so that we can experience his new wine and his new blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.